I'll tell you what, we can actually um, probably, I don't know why we couldn't just pull that down a little bit out of the way. Okay. I tell you what, your, your mind, let's go ahead and introduce what we're going to be getting like to the second debate and just okay. go ahead and introduce what's going on and then say I've got the press first in front of us, so here we go and then we'll start the talk. A little quicker that way. Let me know if you want to do it. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Mario, he's going to make an introduction before he starts to speak, and then I'm going to start to speak. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and introduce the evening. I want to thank you all for being here tonight, seeing this to be important in your life, and further, I encourage you to rightly divide the word. Uh, as you know, this is part two of part two. Uh, this is a part two of Steve and I debating tonight. I am in the affirmative, as I was last night. And uh, all of this is being uploaded to the internet, so uh, hopefully if you're here and you're being challenged, you'll be able to review. And if you're not here, you're being challenged wherever you are. Um, again, I'm Michael Miano. I am the pastor of Blue Point Bible Church on Long Island, New York. And it's my privilege to be here and, of course, be in the affirmative in regards to what you see there on the screen. The scriptures teach those who belong to Christ are his by grace through faith alone. I'd like to start with an apology for some of my behavior last night. I come up and I speak softly, and I aim to be humble, as humble as I can be, with my teaching in sound doctrine and rebuking those who oppose it. However, as I sat in my seat off the camera, I laughed, shook my head, spoke out of turn. All things you will see less from me. I'm sorry. I also want to encourage and admonish Steve to speak a bit slower, lower, and maybe even softer. I know we have given him the excuse of passion and his labor of love uh, to convince me, us, of the necessity of water baptism. However, let's also keep in mind, louder, faster speech and diehard belief does not make one's belief correct. Amen. That's man's wisdom and man's mind. Also, people are here in this place seeking to listen and learn from us. Uh, as I explained in last, my affirmative last night, that's my way of learning. I listen, I study, I think through, I ponder through what is said. As the noble Bereans did in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, they searched the scriptures to see if what they were hearing was true. Also, there's a host of people online trying to listen to the arguments we made. I'm sure you saw the same comments I did. And the third reason is that these truths are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 tells us that natural man does not understand the things of God. So contrary to Steve's assertion that I don't understand these things because I don't study my Bible well enough, I would make the assertion that these things are spiritually discerned. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 through 19, we read, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the boundless greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. If you remember last night, I encouraged people to underline in their Bible. So if you're reading it in your own Bible, what I'd encourage you to do is underline with the working of the strength of his might. It's not about Mike Miano's strength. It's not about Steve Bazin's strength or any of you. But rather, it's the Lord opening the eyes of our hearts. Notice the prayer. I pray that the Lord opens the eyes. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. This is not something that we can do on our own. But rather, he must give us eyes to see and ears to hear. What does that mean? That he must give us eyes to see and ears to hear? The hope of his calling. That's election. The riches of the glory of his, of his inheritance in the saints. That's the church. The boundless power toward us who believe. What is that power? That's the power that he calls you. He chose you, he calls you. Those he calls, he keeps. It's perseverance. These are in accordance with the exertion, some translations say. Many others say the working of his might. His is Jesus, perfectly all know that. 
Last night after the debate, I had the privilege of speaking with an elder from Blue Point Bible Church. Admittedly, I was a bit dismayed at the way Steve was bringing forth some of his argument. I was a bit dismayed at, as I had said to my elder, how can a man who has such good arguments and points to make in one regard seemingly argue against good arguments and points in the other regard, or in other regards? My elder encouraged me with the exact phrase that I brought before you all last night. Michael, God speaks to people in ways they understand. He offered this as an encouragement, but also as an admonishment to me. I knew coming out here that large majority of the room, large majority of the people here, would not agree with my view. My view, again, being that there are those who belong to God, that are called by God, called and elected, or his by grace through faith alone. So I shouldn't expect much favor toward my position from an assembly that I knew I was going to meet with that didn't agree with me. So part and parcel of me offering an affirmative is for me to be like God and try to understand where you're coming from, speak to you in ways that you would understand, and as you talk to me, partly vice versa. One writer noted, when you present your, all, your views clearly, specifically, visually, and most importantly, contextually, in the context of a deep understanding of another's paradigm and concerns, you significantly increase the credibility of your own ideas. So I assume most of you here, and I know Steve does, have a foundational knowledge of how to properly read the Bible. Yes, there is a way to properly read the Bible. One aspect often highlighted by circles that Steve and I run in is audience relevance. Audience relevance means that when we study the Bible, we must read it through the lens of the original audience. Why? Because God spoke to them in ways that they understood, that are oftentimes foreign to us in the 21st century. <clears throat> Me asserting that there are details in Scripture that might seem like they are saying one thing to us, but rather they meant something else for the people in the first century, should not cause confusion, at least not to those who have come to, come to understand such concepts. Audience relevance carries further than just talking about eschatology. It applies to the whole of Scripture. Dare I assert, it even has to do with how God deals with his people. Then and today, God continues to speak to people in ways that we understand. New Testament scholar Pete Enns made the following remark about audience relevance. When God reveals himself, he always does so to people, which means that he must speak and act in ways that they will understand. The Bible at every turn shows how connected it is to its own world. So rather than confusion when I assert that there are details found in Scripture that apply to the convictions and perspective of the people in the Scripture, in this regard pertaining to the ritual of water baptism, we should not be confused. God speaks to people in ways they understand. This is why your Bible brings forth truths and details the way that it does. This is why the Apostle Paul said that when I'm among the Jews, I become a Jew. When I'm among the Greeks, I become a Greek. Or when I'm among those that are under law, I become as those that are under law. When I'm among the Greeks, I become as one that is not under law. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 20 through 22. This is why the Jews, coming to understand what the Spirit was doing in the first century, still enacted the ritual of order baptism. This is why the Apostle Paul underwent the shaving of his head and making a vow under law in Acts chapter 18. This is why the Gentiles were encouraged to undergo water baptism, the ritual of water baptism, because it would help them to understand what God was doing in and through them. This is why Timothy was circumcised in accordance with the law. It's in Acts chapter 16, verse 3. This is why the Ephesians were encouraged to bring all their witchcraft books to be burned in Acts chapter 19. This is why the demoniac in the Gospels is asked to go, he asks to go against the pagans. Interesting study on the word east. Uh, it's outside. It's all Greek to me, so I'm going to encourage you to do that on your own time. We must, understanding that the details of Scripture being made known to an audience foreign to us is required. The details don't necessarily apply to us. And this is not taking details out of the Scriptures. It's simply good hermeneutics, which means Bible interpretation. God is the wonderful counselor. You read this in Isaiah 9, 6. Which means, I don't know how you determine what a counselor is, but a good counselor means he knows you, gets to know you intimately. 
He listens to you. He understands you. He brings forth his truth so that we might know him. What the word sets out to do, the word accomplishes. As I have come to understand God as a wonderful counselor, I adore his way of dealing with us through his word, Jesus. That is the word, Jesus. This is not a Bible study, but rather a divine experience, as much as Steve might try to mock that. Your testimony is important, regardless of what Steve says about that. To your own master, you stand before you. Read that in Romans 14. That is why the Lord is the discerner of hearts and intentions, not man. You read that in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10, as well as Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Notice this. The Lord is the discerner of intents of man's heart, not the Bible. The Lord. The Lord knows the heart. Man simply knows outward expressions, which can lead to wrong conclusions. His judgments are, his judgments are truly unsearchable. You read that in Romans chapter 11. God looks at the heart, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. Remember the promise? I brought it before you last night. He will give you a new heart. The Lord looks at the heart. He sees a heart that is against him, and he sees hearts that are for him. He looks at the heart. God knows the heart. We read that in Luke chapter 16, verse 15, Acts chapter 15, verse 8. All throughout the book of Acts, we see God knows the heart of his people. God opens the heart. Acts chapter 16, verse 14. Remember, Lydia opened her heart. Also, as I mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 19, I pray that the Lord will open your heart. This responds to what Steve asked last night about how someone accepts the gospel and becomes a believer. That's the way the Apostle Paul understood it. The Lord opens the hearts of believers and causes them to respond. The Lord causes them to respond. We will cover that again tonight, as I brought out last night. God has so designed his truth that it is to be made known through the church. That's Ephesians 3.10. Not just an individual. I sure hope that we, in the least, agree on that. I'm convinced that alone we cannot comprehend, understand, or know God in all his ways. Again, his ways are beyond us. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord. Romans chapter 8 talks about wisdom that is beyond us. Some of us have experiences of and with God that others cannot understand. Some have knowledge of God that others have not attained. Some have intrinsic personality traits that make clear certain things about God that are not necessarily readily available to others. That is why in the Old Testament, God spoke in many ways. We see that in Hebrews chapter 1. In the times past, he spoke in many ways and in diverse, diverse uh, sorry, spoke to many people in diverse ways. And in the last days, he spoke to us through his son, which is the proper designation of the word. The word was in the beginning. The word was with God. The word was God, John 1, 1. The word speaks in his sheep, hear his voice. That's what we read in John 10, verses 27 to 28. The word speaks, Jesus speaks, and his sheep hear his voice. Or, as I said before, what the word sets out to accomplish, it does. That's Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. As well as Jeremiah chapter 1, 12, where it says, The Lord is watching over his word to perform it. So again, God speaks to people in ways they understand. When Jesus said, those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, he wasn't talking about people not having eyes and ears. He was pointing out the necessity of spiritual discernment. How does one have spiritual discernment? God provides. God makes man obedient and willing. And I will reiterate those verses for you tonight. If we speak with spiritual words, which is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, those who have the Spirit will hear. His sheep hear his voice. Those who don't have ears to hear and eyes to see won't hear or see the truth. This is not Calvinism. I didn't bring that phrase up last night. Steve did. I don't like to be referred to as a Calvinist. I've actually said that time and time again. Rather, what I'm bringing for you is the biblical detail of sovereign grace. In many regards, Steve is debating himself. 
and the straw man keys the box. That's just another reason I believe having good audio is important. I exhort each of us to, as I mentioned in the first part of this debate, rewind the tape, listen to the arguments, take your time, ponder these things. Be noble when you're searching in the scriptures. Prove all things. Rewind the tape and ask Steve, ask for yourself, why Steve has to switch my words and put words in my mouth to insert a negative. Calvinism, doing away with the ritual of water baptism, a do-nothing gospel, a love that does nothing, all of which I've never said. So last night I sought to establish the wickedness of man, meaning man is totally unable and unwilling to seek the Lord. And I provided you with a biblical a narrative argument. How did Adam find the Garden of Eden? And I offered up many proof texts in regards to the wickedness of man. I also sought to show you that baptism throughout the scriptures is not just water baptism. And that the baptism that saves is the spirit, meaning the water. And I offered the narrative of that. Or I showed you the Old and New Testament where there was allusion to a spirit being water. One of the texts I regularly bring people back to is Psalm 51 where David cried out to the Lord to wash him. And I don't believe he was talking about the water of baptism, the water baptism. What water washes? I also sought to bring before you the seeming misnomer of faith alone. Correct, and I offered a correction on what faith alone actually means to those that teach it. It means a saving faith, a persevering and active belief, not just believe in Jesus and it's all good and you're good to go. I don't know anybody that believes in faith alone that teaches that. So today, thank you. What I want to highlight for us, in John 10, 1, we read, truly, truly, notice the parallelism, repeating a phrase, truly, truly. What that means is this is important. You have to take into consideration what this is saying. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way. He is a thief and a robber. Steve brought this text up in his first, first affirmative to speak about our entrance into the kingdom of God. This is good, because here's a text we supposedly agree upon. You must come through Christ. Amen. How do you come to Christ? Let's see what the text says. If you'd like to turn with me to John chapter 10, starting at verse 2. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep, Jesus. Jesus enters by the door. To him, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And a stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of the strangers. If you want to move with me over to verse 7. Jesus therefore said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. I'm going to jump down to verse 14. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall become one flock with one shepherd. Notice how those other sheep of the, that are not of that fold would come to Christ. They would hear his voice, just like those, the first sheep, the first fold, which again, is hopefully we see this illusion for Jew and Gentile. The Jews would come by hearing his voice. The Gentiles would come by hearing his voice. Continuing in the text, Verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe the works I do in my Father's name. These bear witness of me, but you do not believe me because you are not my sheep. 
My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I can give eternal life to them, and they shall not perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me, my Father who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Amen. I will also be concluding my points today, marking out what the Apostle Peter said about entrance into the kingdom. I'd like to share with you each a remark I had made on Facebook that led to this debate. As I mentioned last night, I had listened to Holger Neubauer preach at the Spirit and Life Lectures 2021, and he gave a great presentation, most of it focused on fulfillment, and then at the end he offered up Acts chapter 19 with the necessity of water baptism. And what I wrote on Facebook, and oh, let me read that back. I went through Acts chapter 19, immediately listened to Holger, and I didn't see the word water. I didn't even find the allusion to water baptism. What I did find was men laying their hands on somebody and somebody speaking in tongues, which is foreign to my experience of salvation, as I imagine it's foreign to some of yours, you know, most of yours. And then I wrote on Facebook. That's what started this debate. I wrote on Facebook, and I made this quote. Water baptism must be assumed into texts, rather than understanding the immersion to be something beyond the physical experience of a person, which is the true importance and demonstration of being found in Christ. Now, I say that to you because I've changed that sentence twice. The first thing I had to admit to myself in my studies was, well, no. I had, if you remember, I said, water baptism must be assumed into text. Well, no, you guys read your Bible. Water baptism is clearly in the text in certain places. So that's where I had to say, okay, let me change this. Water baptism must often be assumed into the text. So I backed up. I said, okay, it must often be, not always. And my last remark was, the last change I made to it, was the ritual of water baptism must oftentimes be assumed into texts rather than understanding the immersion to be something beyond the physical experience of a person, which is the true importance and demonstration of being found in Christ. Thank you. So I think I finally figured out that you shut it off when you take it off. That's what's happening. Yeah. That's why I'm playing the drums. Okay. Yeah. There yeah. we go. Figure it out. So it's that mic. There's hope in you. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Um, I don't think so. Let me just come out of here to pull up my chart. Go ahead and drop that. Okay. Drop that. Pull this up. Okay, start the time, all right? Mike, let me back up too. If I have misquoted you or taken your words out of context, forgive me. Um, there are things when one plus one equals two, you may not say two, but that may be implied. So consider that whenever I say certain things. I, you may not have directly said that. You may not even be thinking that's what you mean, but by implication, that may be ultimately where you're going. That may be why I'm saying that, and that's another discussion, but if I've misrepresented you, please point it out to me. I'll correct that, okay? Um, yesterday, in Long Island, two weeks ago, and even so far today, it's how God does these things. He really emphasized on how God opens the heart and is a discerner of, of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And, you know, so I'm going to get on to that right now, and I'm going to do it. Because I want to focus on the Word for a few minutes, the Word of God. He said explicitly, this is not a Bible study, this is about divine experience. That was a direct quote. And so I'm going to say we cannot have a divine experience without the Word of God. And even this experience must be within the realm of how the Word directs. And I'm going to explain that. 
through this text. So I'm slowing down. I want to talk softer. I've been admonished by several. Steve, speak slower. Go softer. Go easier. And uh, I assure you that it's not mean spirited. Spirited when I do get wound up, get going. So let's go slowly. Let's talk about this. Let's emphasize some of these things. In Acts chapter 13, verse 46, Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It is necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Paul and Barnabas were great missionaries to the Gentile world. To the Jew first and also to the Greek, though, is how Paul would always conduct himself. He would always go to the synagogues first, go to the Jew. And here they said, seeing you have put the word from you, the word, it was necessary for the word of God to be spoken first, but since you reject it, that's the word, you and judge yourselves of more than you go what? Rejecting the word of everlasting life. Behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Paul and Barnabas knew the hearts of these people. He said they were judged by the word. The word is what discerned it here. It was so bad that this word, they were rejecting it so forthrightly that they left and went to a whole other people. This is the word of God in action at this point. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Hebrew writer would write, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Does God discern your heart? Sure does. How does the heart become discerned? How does it, how does this heart, the thoughts and intents be revealed? Well, through the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. God puts his word out there. How are you going to respond to it? Are you going to accept it? Are you going to reject it? Jesus would say, out of the mouth proceedeth the things of the heart. The things we say. Jesus said, you can know them by their fruits. He says, God is the only one that can discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. But I disagree with that. I can know you by your fruits. If you're going out every night and getting drunk, I know you're a drunkard. I know your heart desires drunkenness. It's that simple. If you're telling me, if you're using God's name in vain, out of your heart, these things are coming forth out of your mouth. I can know your heart thinks God's name is nothing to you and you can just use it in vain. And it happens through the word of God. The word of God discerns these things. In Romans chapter 2, verse 16, also on the board. In the day will God, uh, when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Beautiful. According to my gospel. Let me emphasize this. I'm going to slow down. God will judge the secrets of men. You think that's in your heart? I think so. Yeah, everybody in there is going, yeah, uh-huh. By Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Paul wrote that. It's Paul's gospel. But Paul's gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's one faith. Paul's teaching the exact same things Jesus is teaching. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And he says that by his gospel, the secrets of the heart are judged. I agree. God discerns the heart's intent. It discerns the heart's thoughts. I agree. Again, how, how, how? He says this is not a Bible study. That's his problem. I told him this in Long Island. That's your problem. You're not really studying your Bible. Forgive me. I'm not being mean. I'm not being crude. I, I believe what a lot of people do is they study commentaries or they approach it with, a, with sort of a, a goggles on where they only can see it a certain way, and they're not really discerning it for all that it has to offer them, and they're limiting themselves in their studies. John chapter 6, verse 63, watch this carefully. And the Spirit, it is the Spirit that quickeneth, brings to life. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak of you, they are spirit and life, and they are life. The words are as what brings the life. That's what brings even the information of the Spirit to you. Everybody who's listening to my voice right now, listen to me carefully. You would not know whether there be any Holy Spirit if it was not for the Word of God. If it wasn't for the Word of God, you would know nothing of the Spirit of God. That's how we learn about it. That's how we know about it. Michael has got it reversed. He said it's not about Bible study. It's about a divine experience. 
But you wouldn't know about a divine experience if it wasn't for God's word. You wouldn't know even how to rightly divide those things. So I want to slow down. I want to go through these things because we have to get this. In Jude chapter 1, verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The faith was once delivered unto the saints. And it was something that they all had common. I said this to Mike before. God doesn't save people differently. He saves us all the exact same way. And it happens through the faith which comes by hearing the word, which Jude is admonishing to earnestly contend for that one that was in the Bible, and it was given 2,000 years ago. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to really hit this in just a few minutes harder. Now, now watch Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Perverting the gospel of Christ removes you from the grace of God. The gospel comes from the word. The gospel is revealed in the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation. If you pervert that, you're removed from the grace of God. You don't have the grace of God. Verse 7, or verse 8. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. The gospel is the discerner of good and evil, of right and wrong, of your hearts, of your intents, of your actions. And if anybody brings another gospel, they're accursed. How can I know if somebody's accursed? By means of the gospel. Amen. By the word of God. That's what this does the discerning. In Acts chapter 20, verse 27, the apostle Paul said, For I have not shown to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Now I'm emphasizing how the faith was once delivered, how that Paul said there's a gospel. If anybody preaches any other, they're going to be accursed. Here, Paul says he taught all the counsel of God. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, please notice, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond that which is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. Don't go beyond that which is written. Listen to what he said. This is not a Bible study. This is about divine intervention divine experience that's going beyond that which is written that's exactly what he's doing that's why yesterday he brought his bible up here said they didn't have it for four centuries and jesus is the word it's something other than the bible listen to me carefully please i'm trying to remain calm anybody who appeals to anything other than the bible is doing so because they can't prove their proposition from the Bible, so they need to get some divine experience from some other source than the Bible to try to prove their point. But now I want to take you back to his proposition. Mike, don't forget this. You signed a proposition with me. You agreed to a proposition that says the scriptures teach Amen. that we're saved by grace through faith alone. The scriptures teach. The first thing he does is get up here and says, they didn't even have it. Well, not the first thing he does, excuse me. They didn't even have the Bible for four centuries. And Jesus is the word. It doesn't always happen through the Bible. This is not about Bible study. But his affirmation is, the scriptures teach these things. Please provide it from the scriptures. Now he can get up here and says, God does this. God does that. I don't disagree with that. My point is, how does God do it? Now, And this is very important and very critical. And so Paul gives the admonition, don't go beyond that which is written. I've got it right here. When anyone has to appeal to something other than the scripture, that means he cannot use scripture to prove his position. So he's got to appeal to another source. Here's his proposition. Scripture speaks. Those who belong to Christ, it is by grace through faith alone. Jesus said, uh, Mayano says, the word is Jesus. He says this in order to subjugate the written word. He's trying to sidestep it. He's trying to say it really, really, really doesn't matter because Jesus is the word. Not the New Testament, not the Bible, or in addition to it, or something separate and apart from it. And I got to use this source rather than this source. But your proposition, you agreed to, to stay on this right here, right there. And all you've done so far, in my estimation, to a large degree, 
is try to find it from another source, and it will not work. John 12, 48, the one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. Who's the judge of those who reject Jesus and his words? The words that Jesus has spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day, John 12, 48. Who's the judge? The word of God. Every single one of us in this room and the internet right now, <laughs> Whoever may listen in the future is being judged by the word of God at this exact second. I have it in its completed form in the New Testament. I can read right now whether I'm a sinner or whether I've been cleansed, washed from my sins. And if we walk in the light as he is in a, uh, the light, we have fellowship with one another and his blood cleanses, washes us. Yes, it's, it's symbolic. This cleansing is symbolic of washing Away the sins. The washing is symbolic of something. Now, I wanted to go to Luke chapter 8. I'm not sure if this is the exact time to do it, but uh, give me some time. All right, what have I got left here? In Luke 8, Luke records a parable of the seed is the word of God. I'm going to go through this quickly, okay? Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Wait a minute. Hang on. What? The devil's doing what? Taking away the word out of Mike, do you believe the devil causes people to be lost? Right? Do, now, you, you believe God does some kind of a intervention, is your word. Divine. Does the, did the devil do some divine intervention here and, 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 take, and take their salvation from them? Oh, but wait a minute here. Then comes the devil, taketh away the word out of our hearts. Oh, the devil, yeah, he just, he waved his hands over him like a magician, and, and God's word left him. What made him part of God's word anyway? God, what made him a part of God's word? Okay? They on the rock are they which, when they hear, hear what? The word, receive the word with joy. Oh, and these have no root. Which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among the thorns are they, which when they have heard the word, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground they are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, bring forth fruit with patience. How do we produce fruit from the seed? which is the word. How do I know it? By how you're responding to the word. Now watch it, folks, carefully here. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter may see the light. He's telling you, put your Bibles away. This ain't a Bible study. He's saying, put your light under the bed. It doesn't matter. Jesus is saying something totally different. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Take heed, therefore, how you hear. Whosoever hath to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not from him shall be taken, even that which seemeth to be right. Oh, but the devil took from him. Isn't that right? Isn't that what he said? The devil took from him. No. How? What happened is... <laughs> The influence and the cares and the temptation of the world, those things that represent evil, overcame the word of God in their hearts, and they went back to carnality. Do the word. I'm getting loud. I apologize. Now, I want to emphasize a couple of other things here, because he keeps talking about the Spirit and his work. So I want to address, and we left our conversation last night about the work of the Spirit. So let's get into this right now. The Holy Spirit in his work. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, the Bible says, and take the helmet of salvation and the word, excuse me, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I've asked Michael a thousand times, how does the Spirit work? Ephesians 6, 17 says, through the word of God. That's how the Spirit works, through the word of God. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profit of nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are The words of God are spirit and life. He keeps citing 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. The apostle Paul there says that we're to discern the spiritual words. Comparing spiritual words with spiritual 
That's the idea. Look it up in the original uh, interlinear, and you'll see there this comparing spiritual words to spiritual words. We compare what Moses said to what Jeremiah said to what Peter said to what Jesus said. They should all harmonize. The natural man doesn't want to get it. Why? He's spiritually discerned. He doesn't care about it. But when you care about it, now you can discern it. How can you discern it? Through the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. Now, as thou hast sent me into the world, Jesus' words here, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. What's the truth? The word. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy words. You're sanctified through the word of God. Now watch this. Neither pray I for these alone, he's talking about his apostles here, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. <clears throat> that all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Mike agrees with me that the day of the Lord has already come. The gospel is the judge. He believes in real life eschatology. He's, he's, he's affirming that. Absolutely. Mike understands then that we're, we could be made one through the word, not divine experience. Amen. He should ex understand that. It's the word that causes us to be one. It's the word that does all these things. In John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He's hit this four times. I told him I was going to address it. And then my last speech, and here it is. I'm addressing it. Right, right. Here's divine commentary on it. First Peter 1.22. Seeing it, purified your souls and obey the truth through the Spirit. Unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Did you see the connection? Jesus said in John 3, 5, except a man be born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Peter says it this way. Purifying your souls and obeying the truth. There's the water. You must have the water through the Spirit. Through the, the Spirit gives you the direction to do it. It gives you the word. It gives you the insight. It gives you the information you need. Now watch this. Being born again. There it is. Except you're born again. Born of the water. Not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. That's how the Spirit operates, Mike. By the word of God, the Spirit's operating that you obey the truth, which is incorruptible. It's not corruptible. God's truth is not corruptible. Now the parable says the seed is the word of God. We have also a more sure word. He brought this up yesterday. Excuse me. He did, uh, I'm going to bring this up right now. He brought this one up. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Where do you do well? That you take heed as into a light that shines in the dark place until the day dawn. The day star rise in your hearts, knowing this verse that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. That means the holy men who were speak, speaking the word of God didn't have their own interpretation, wasn't given their own point of view. They were inspired by God, which is what the next verse says. Knowing this verse, no prophecy of, of scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now earlier, Peter said this, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Peter said they already had all things, all things that pertain to the life and godliness through the knowledge. Can't be changed, comes through the word. Came through, and that's all God discerns. We're going to get into this a little bit more. Let's take 10 minutes. Uh, I've got um, seven, about 7.45, so in about 10 minutes, Take a bathroom break, and we'll come back, and we'll we'll continue. <laughs> does anybody want a break, or does everybody, does everybody want to keep going? Or you, 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 it's up, I'll leave it up to the folks. There's a couple of people need a bathroom break. Let's take ten minutes. <laughs>
Hidden interests and yeah. Go ahead, Mike, if you want to call. Hey folks, it's time to get started. Let's let's keep fighting our seats. Jake, you gotta start the recording, right? Jim, just a moment to grab a seat there, Mike. Okay, we're all back. All right. Well, first thing I want to encourage everybody to do is keep your Bibles out. I didn't encourage you to put your Bible away, so don't do that. Um, I want to talk about Bible study. So when we first, we have this book. There's one thing we can do with it. We can just open it up and read it. And if you've done that, you know that there's plenty of things in there that need to be further expounded upon. Now, there's details in here that you can read through it. You can search the scriptures, and you can find answers to things Obviously, in the Old Testament, we move into the New Testament and find the apostles explaining the things that are in the Old Testament. However, I find it to be an arrogant view to think that we should not go to commentaries. There's plenty of things in the scripture that most people have no common knowledge of because we're not in the first century. We, were, we didn't live in the BC times. So it's important to gain an understanding of history. It's important to gain an understanding of culture and, and you know, all the different things that fill the scriptures. Yes, this is a beautiful book in and of itself. Amen. This is a book. And this book needs to be understood spiritually, and it needs to be understood contextually. Contextual knowledge does not simply mean just reading the book from front to back, but it also means gaining a comprehensive understanding of the details that are found in it, which does require, yes, going beyond that which is written. We need to further understand. Again, here we are, proponents. I know Steve's a proponent of fulfilled eschatology. One thing I often hear people say when I bring up the destruction of Jerusalem is they say, that's not in the Bible. Well, no, because you need to go outside of the Bible to understand the history and the culture and, and the different details that fill in the blank. So uh, right there, uh, he said that I believe that you need to go beyond which is written. Yes, I, need to, I do believe you need to gain an understanding of the details um, by going outside of the Bible and, and gaining commentaries. Again, commentaries can be tricky because they're usually flavored by uh, whatever a group of people you're studying with. As I had mentioned last night to someone here, that even the Bibles that we hold are flavored by interpretation. 
Uh, their English, this is an English translation of Hebrew and Greek that many people have sat around and discussed and debated over what different words are translated as. So yes, I do believe that we need to go beyond that which is written to better understand our Bible. That's how we gain audience relevance, as a matter of fact. He said that anyone who is not going to argue from the Bible cannot. Now, I just wanted to reiterate what I had said in my opening statement there, and this is the exact phrase. I said, this is not just a Bible study, but rather a divine experience, as much as Steve might like to mock that. And again, the reason I was pointing that out is because God is the wonderful counselor, meaning he knows us, he knows our hearts and our intentions. Now, I know Steve went on a lot about how he knows people's hearts and apostles knew people's hearts. I'll encourage you to study through that on your own. I'm not in the negative tonight. Uh, also, uh, Steve mentioned the Word of God, and he brought up some good text. The Hebrews had this understanding of this word memra. I would encourage you to study through the Hebrew understanding of memra. It's M-E-M-R-A. Uh, they understood what the Word of God was. And as we move into the New Testament, S Steve talked about harmonizing Scripture. Amen. John 1.1. 1, 1. Scripture does not go against other Scriptures. John 1.1 1, 1 tells you what? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. It's not this. So now that we've, uh, I encourage people to further study of uh, when the Bible was put together. Do a historical study. That does, that will take you outside of the Bible. Yes, amen. Do the study. See for yourself when this Bible was put together. See for yourself what the first, second, and third century, fourth century Christians believed was the word of God. What scriptures they studied, which you might find interesting that they studied other scriptures outside of these 66 books. The third thing I wanted to mention was Romans chapter 2. I closed the book, which I didn't intend to do. Uh, Romans chapter 2, I just wanted to read through the rest of the text that Steve uh, wanted to back it up a little bit here. He mentioned verse 16. I want to start at verse 14. So in Romans chapter 2, verse 14, it says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law, notice this, do instinctively, meaning they didn't have the book, they didn't have the details. They did instinctively the things of the law. These not having the law are a law unto themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts. Written by who? He talked about the Old Testament promise. The Lord would write the law on their hearts. These do instinctively the things of the law, not having the law. They are a law unto themselves in that they show the work of the law written on their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternatively accusing or else defending them on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of all men through Christ Jesus. Just wanted to give you further thought there of what's actually going on in Romans chapter 2, rather than the way that Steve seemed to be using verse 16. And the fourth point I want to make in regards to Luke chapter 8, I love Luke chapter 8, the parable of the sower. The question I often ask people, when they, especially when they go to uh, Luke chapter 8 and you see that good and reasonable heart, is, do you know how to plant a garden? Have you ever planted seeds? And when you go about planting seeds, you know that it just, you don't just take seeds and start throwing them around. In order for a sower to properly sow, he goes and prepares the ground. The sower prepares the ground. So yes, there's a good and reasonable heart that the Lord made in Luke chapter 8 that received him. That's exactly what the text is saying. That the Lord went out to sow, that's the sower. He prepared the ground before he sows the seed. He prepared the hearts that would come to him. That's been my point last night. That he makes the heart pure. He makes the heart obedient and willing. So now I'm going to continue on with the rest of my presentation here. I want to bring us back to something we talked about a little bit last night. Someone had said to me, why are you taking baptism out of the Bible? Water baptism, the ritual of water baptism out of the Bible. I want to be clear, I do not mock or take away your ritual of water baptism. Especially if it has further enabled you to have a clear conscience toward God, as it did for many through the scriptures. The church I am privileged to co-labor with regards the ritual of water baptism as a solemn and beautiful emblem in their constitution. While, while I am in the affirmative regarding God's provision of grace through faith and his divine election, what I am contending against is not the fact that you've been water baptized, not water baptism at all. I'm contending against the view that the ritual of water baptism that you agreed to. You did agree to be water baptized in that tub that you were baptized here. You agreed to it. Okay. So it's something you did. That is not the source or security of your salvation. It's his work that is the foundation, the source and security 
of your salvation. Anything you do is simply working out his work. It was his work, his power, his exertion of power that caused you to have what you have today. Anything you simply do is a further working out of his work. We must be sure we are being immersed or baptized into the right thing. Also, to suppose the one work of obedience is the obedience required by God is simply erroneous and can contribute to wrong focus or laziness. That being said, we must be careful of external works. Be they ritual of water baptism, expression of love, good deeds, etc., as the source of our right standing with God. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, there were those that had come to the Lord. And what did they say on that day of judgment? Lord, we did this in your name. We did this in your name. We cast out demons in your name. I believe those people most likely water baptized. But then what did the Lord say to them? Depart from me, I never knew you. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, Jesus rebuking the Pharisees, he tells them what? They honor me with their lips. They do all the outside stuff but their hearts are far from me, which is a reiteration of Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. Also in Matthew chapter 23, verse 25, Jesus rebukes the Pharisee. He says something interesting. He says, you wash, here we are talking about washing, you wash the outside of the cup, but inside, meaning in your heart, you're full of dead bones. He, he went on to say, wash the inside of the cup, and then the outside of the cup will be clean. I agree with Steve that it is detrimental to teach people that they are saved if they are not, which was an assertion made in his first affirmative. He mentioned that for that very reason, he drove all the way from Michigan, and he'd fly, or he'd drive. I had fly originally, I must have changed that. Uh, he'd drive all the way to the ends of the earth to help people know how they are saved from their sins, and I commend that, amen. I'd say the same thing. I, too, for the reason of making sure the gospel is preached, that it's nothing you do will ever provide salvation, but Christ's work alone. I drove all the way from New York, and I would drive to the ends of the earth to declare that. One pastor noted, if Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. How dare the attempt be made that you must experience a one-time dunking in water as an expression of obedience, and thus, by particular mechanics, you are now clean and saved. Baptism is an everyday work of God by way of his spirit, to clean our conscience of wicked things. I ask you, did you stop sinning when you went through the ritual of water baptism? It's unfortunate that when many Christians hear the word baptism, not only do they immediately think of the ritual of water baptism, they also fail to realize that baptism was already an existing part of Jewish history. Josephus, in his writings in the Antiquities, he explains the Jewish ritual of water baptism. And listen to this. The washing would be acceptable to God if they made use of it, not in order to the putting away of some sins, but for the purification of the body, supposing still that the soul was thoroughly purified beforehand by righteousness. This is why John the Baptist rebuked the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 3. If you remember when they were coming to be water baptized, what did he say to them? Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, you brood of vipers? Because he Discerning their heart. They didn't have the righteousness before they came to be washed in the water. They didn't check themselves. They didn't understand what they were being baptized into. As I mentioned last night, there are a variety of baptisms mentioned in the scripture. In the Old Testament, we find the immersion rituals. We covered a little bit of that in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2 last night. We see the holy place in the scriptures where all of the items in the holy place needed to be baptized in blood. The blood of the sacrifice. We read of the baptism of Moses in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, we see the Pharisees arguing with Jesus as to why his disciples do not baptize. Some translations even say that. Baptize their hands. Washing their hands. In Acts chapter 1 verse 5, we read of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The baptism that is essential is the baptism by the Spirit. That was promised and prophesied in the Old Testament. This is which would cause us, the people of God, to demonstrate Christ. The term for baptism used in the scriptures implied not simply being immersed, but rather being consumed. The baptism that matters is the baptism that causes the believer to be consumed by Christ to the effect of change, a new creation. I want to go back to something Steve had said last night about the word consumed. If you were to go ahead and do a word study on the word consumed, now, do the scriptures 
by and large, consume has to do with the shrine. So we see that. However, if you were to do just continue to read through the different Greek words, there's a variety of different Greek and Hebrew words that are used for consume in the Old and New Testament. When you go ahead and you study out the word consume, it also means to fill, to fill in. To, that's what the vinegar I mentioned in the pickles last night. And by the way, that wasn't my own fancy speech. That is the first use of the word bathtub in Greek. That's the first known use of the word was in the candor of putting together a recipe for pickles. It's not a convention of my own. Simply put, baptism is not something you do. It's something done to you. The salvific baptism is a process of rebirth initiated by God, which we, with which we have as much to do as we did our first birth. Consider also the contrasts of John's baptism by water and Christ's baptism by the Spirit. Found all throughout the scriptures, what I found interesting about this is actually the four Gospels and the book of Acts all agree. I'll show you the text. We mentioned one of them last night, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. John came baptizing with water. Jesus came baptizing with Holy Spirit and fire. The next text we would go to would be Mark chapter 1, verse 8. In Mark chapter 1, verse 8, it says, And immediately, sorry, I baptize you with water, John the Baptist, but he, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John chapter 1, verse 33. That was the text I was alluding to last night, by the way. John chapter 1, verse 33. And I did not, I'm sorry, that is not it. That, 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 that leads into it, but I wanted to go back to uh, verse 26. John 1, 26 says, John answered them, said, I baptize you in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who after me, whose thong of sandals, of his sandals, I am not worthy to untie. And then in verse 33, and I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then in Luke chapter 3, verse 16, John answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water. But one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Spirit not many days from now. And then also in Acts chapter 11, verse 16, And I remembered the word for the, of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So I've mentioned the scriptures that mark out the metaphor for the spirit as water. I mentioned quite a bit of them last night. Uh, we, honestly, I encourage a study just from John chapter 1 all the way through to John chapter 7. And ask yourself, well, what is the water? And it's the spirit. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, we read about Christ and his church. By the way, I'm reading out of an NASB Bible. And it says here in the NASB, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave, herself, gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Now, unfortunately, there seems to be a lot of conversation about it being by water. No, it's washing of water with the word. The word is what washes you. Jesus is what cleanses you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, again, I believe the Apostle Paul agrees with himself. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says in verse 11, And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Furthermore, in chapter 12, verse 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. I'm going to read that verse one more time. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. There's one body. There's one spirit. There's one baptism. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. And we were all made to make drink of one spirit. Again, I made an assertion last night that was uh, Steve's words from his affirmative, and I want to make it again. 
No one is saved in any other way than what is revealed in Scripture. There's only one way to be saved. I'm not going to read 1 Corinthians 12.13 to you again. That's the baptism that saves you and brings you into the body. Keep in mind, one spirit, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. I always find it interesting when we go to Ephesians 4.4, 4, I read all of those things as unseen things. The Father is unseen, the Lord is unseen, the baptism is unseen, the faith is unseen. I Actually, I believe most of you would agree with me, except for the ritual of water baptism. For some reason, that's a physical thing. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, we read, as a matter of fact, I'll turn there. And matter of fact, I want to back us up here. Verse 18. For Christ also died for sins once and for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who were once disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Thank you. And corresponding to that, some translations even say, and this is a symbol of baptism now saving you. Not the removing of dirt from the flesh. Not the baptism that Josephus understood that I mentioned from the antiquities. But an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the baptism that, that now saves you. A good conscience through an appeal in Christ's work. This text keeps being brought up to me. I was brought up during Steve's affirmative, and it was being brought up on social media constantly, about the water. Who got wet in the days of Noah? Noah and his family? No. They were brought through the water by the ark. The ark saved them through the water. Yes, the water carried the ark, but they were brought through the water by the ark. Jesus is our ark. It's our salvation. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, we read the goal of our faith. The goal of our faith is this. Love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. In Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 38, I want to go ahead and turn there. I know we keep bringing up Acts chapter 2, verse 38, but I want to read verse 37 because I believe it's important to see what's going on before the baptism. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? So notice what happened first. They were pierced to the heart. Something happened inside of them. They began to realize they were convicted. We must do something. And then what does Peter say? And Peter said to them, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Ready, Mario? Say when. I'm going to pick up where I left off. Mike, that was the best argument I've heard you make so, make so far. Yeah, I, I I commend you for that, but we're going to take it apart right now, and we're going to we're going to dissect it. We're going to see, you know, what what is actually taking place. Now, here's your water. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. I left off. 2 Peter 1 3, according as the divine power hath given unto us all things pertaining to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him of us to glory and virtue. I want to pick up where I left off and I want to explain to you that his whole contention is the spirit that does this work. I agree with that, but it, it's how does the spirit do the work? He has it separate and apart from the word. I say it has to work by the word. The word directs us to do certain things, and through that, that's how we are known. I established that in my last speech. So 
Let's pick it up from there. Because we're talking about the spiritual gifts and these things like again yesterday we, we ended up with the spiritual gifts idea. And he said in Acts 1 5 and several other passages, uh, Matthew 3, John 1 33, and I'm going to hit all those right now. Uh, so the spiritual gifts were given for a distinct and certain time period for a certain purpose to confirm the word which was in the process of being revealed at that time. What Mike is doing. Whenever he reads that the Spirit is doing something that was perhaps separate and apart from the Word during this time, he's thinking that that is applying to us today somehow to give us some kind of a intervention, I think it was his word, divine intervention. He hasn't done his homework in this regard. He doesn't understand that there is a certain degree of the Spirit that was given for a certain period of time to accomplish a certain work that would bring in the Word of God. And that's what I want to illustrate right now. And it's imperative, and, and I'm, this is going to open up. In Mark chapter 16, verse 20, the disciples went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the Word with signs following. They would be given the gift of the Holy Spirit so that they could go and preach the Word, and like I said yesterday, if they went to the, uh, the, the, the Corinth or Ephesus or wherever they, and they said, we have a word of God for you, they would go there during this time period before they even had the New Testament written. They couldn't open up the book of Ephesians. If he just met them, he hadn't written the book to them yet. So how could they know his message was from God? He would work a miracle to prove the words he was saying was from God. That's the purpose of this special act of the Spirit during this time period. It was to confirm the Word with the signs that followed. They would preach the Word before they had the New Testament written. How can you prove it? Work the signs, work the miracles. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we let them slip. For if the Word spoken by angels, messengers, was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? These words were confirmed. How? Watch this. God bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. What was the purpose of those signs and wonders and diverse miracles? To confirm the word. That was the purpose of that special intervention of the Spirit during this transition period while the New Testament was being written. It was there to build the New Testament. And, it, and I'm going to make this illustration. It was there like scaffolding is there to erect a building today. If you see a building going up, there's men that have scaffolding on the outside of the building, and they're putting up the, the siding and the windows and all the things. That, when they're complete with the building, they take the scaffolding down. When the word was completed, the spiritual gifts were to end. They no longer needed to confirm the word. The word was confirmed for once in all times, and now we're told to contend for the thing that was once delivered. Not go out and work miracles to prove it. Not to say I had a divine intervention. But the, using the word. I, I used this yesterday. Uh, Titus chapter 1. That were to prove things by sound doctrine. Okay? So let's, let's move on in our study. In Daniel chapter 9. Now here's the time period. Here's the time period that these special gifts of the spirit would work in. Seventy weeks are determined upon... Thy people and upon the holy city. You see this right here? Mike knows and understands the holy city is Jerusalem. Do we not? Thank you. He understands that whatever this 70 weeks is, it's going to be accomplished by the end of this holy city by its destruction. We agree with that. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, salvation would come, to make reconciliation for iniquity, forgiveness comes, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. By the time the holy city is taken down, the miraculous gifts of the vision and the prophecy has to end. That's the time period 
in which it was given to accomplish its work. It was given for a time period of 40 years. We're going to get into this more. Look at Micah chapter 7, verse 15. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto them wondrous things. Well, according to the number of days that they came out of the land of Egypt, it was 40 years. They were in the wilderness wandering for 40 years. Micah says, I'm going to give them the wondrous, the miraculous things, literally, look it up in the Hebrew, Hebrew for a period of 40 years. This uh, Holy Spirit intervention doing these miraculous things will last for a period of 40 years, and it was in order to establish, confirm God's word. Zechariah 13, 1. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. In that day, when? When Jerusalem shall be destroyed, it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols of the land, they shall no more be remembered, and also I will cause the prophets and unclean spirit to pass out of the land. This is talking about the miraculous measure and the spiritual working within people to do certain things. The unclean spirits would depart. The miraculous measure of the prophecies would part. When? When salvation would come. If you continue reading in Zechariah into chapter 14, that's when the holy city, Jerusalem, would be destroyed. That's when the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit would come to an end. Well, Jesus said the same thing in Luke 21, and I cited this yesterday. In Luke chapter 21, verse 20, Jesus said, When you see Jerusalem, that's this holy city, compassed with armies, right here, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh, for these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. No more prophecies. The vision will be sealed. No more wondrous, miraculous gifts. It will be all done. When, Jesus, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies. He's not saying anything different than Daniel. If you compare spiritual words with spiritual words, he's saying the same thing as Micah in Micah 7.15. He's saying the same things as Zechariah in Zechariah 13. Now, let's look at this baptism in the name of the Lord. He brought this up from Acts chapter 11, verse 16. I'm oh, so more than happy to oblige him in this understanding. Baptism in the name of the Lord is water baptism. How do I know? Because God's word reveals it. Let's see what God's word says. Peter says to Cornelius, Can any man forbid water that these should be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Can anybody forget what they've done what? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. They did what? Commanded them to be baptized. And they, what kind of baptism? Can any man forbid water that these should be baptized? Baptism in the name of Jesus is water baptism. We explore that in Acts chapter 8 uh, in Long Island, New York, when Philip told the eunuch, he, the, the text says in verse 36, he preached Jesus unto them. In the very next verse, he says, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Preaching Jesus and baptizing in the name of Jesus is water baptism, not Holy Spirit baptism. He thinks he's getting something today that was never given to him. He's got the context out of uh, he, he, he got up and he said, We have to have the context. Let's please establish the context. Please, the context of Holy Spirit baptism was during the transitional period from A.D. 30 to A.D. 70, like Daniel, Micah, Zechariah, Moses would say in Deuteronomy chapter 32, Jesus, Luke 21. It's all throughout, if we're careful. Spirit baptism, which Michael keeps claiming for himself, which John said Jesus would administer, was promised by Jesus only to the apostles. Mike, listen carefully. Holy Spirit baptism was only promised to the apostles. Now, we're going to get into these things a little different, uh, a little deeper. Watch this. He brought up Acts 1 5, brought it up two or three times in his last speech. Let's look at Acts 1 5. In Acts chapter 1, verse 1, the former treatise, Have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach? Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. What was the commandments to the apostles whom he chose? To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, 
being seen of them forty days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, as apostles wait, are you watching this? Commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, he have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days since. That is a direct quote from Matthew chapter 3. Jesus is quoting the words of John the Baptist in Acts chapter 1, and he says he's giving it to the apostles. I told him that yesterday, that the, he's taking that out of context. He said that we receive Holy Spirit baptism today, and I said it was only for them during that transition period to confirm the word of God. Jesus agrees with me here, Mike. Now watch carefully, my friend. And they gave forth their lots. The lot fell upon Matthias. He was numbered with the eleven apostles. Now Matthias and the eleven make twelve. Twelve apostles. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they, the twelve, were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as on fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. There's this promise given to the apostles, the twelve. Watch this now. They were filled, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You continue reading the text, and it clearly says, Peter standing up with the eleven, again, eleven and one is how many? Twelve. This promise was given to whom? The apostles, the twelve. He lifted up his voice and said unto them. In fact, the evidence that they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, was them speaking in tongues. But let's continue the text. Let's see what the Bible says. In Mark chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus said, I will pray to the Father. He shall give you another comforter that you may abide with you, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Who? What? The spirit, the Holy Spirit, who what? The world cannot receive. The world cannot receive. Watch this, please. That's what the text says. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth in, with you and shall be in you. Watch the pronouns here, please. He continues, John. This is Jesus' words. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. You see the pronoun there, you? To whom is Jesus speaking here? You're going to see this in just a moment. But I put this verse here for a quick reason. If you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, which is the Comforter, that would be there while Jesus was absent, Michael, this special operation of the Holy Spirit would come in Jesus' absence. Now, you believe he's returned. I know you do. But in his absence, this special measure of the Spirit is given. And watch this now. When this Spirit would work upon them, it would bring all things to their remembrance. Whatsoever Jesus said. Michael doesn't have everything in his memory that Jesus said. But he claims the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that's what one of the signs you'd have of it. Now watch this carefully. Let's continue the text. Jesus is continuing talking here. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. The apostles were with Jesus. They saw him being baptized at the River Jordan. They were with him from the beginning. And I know that because Acts chapter 1 says, in order for one to be a, an apostle, he must have been an eyewitness to the baptism of Jesus. That's what this text is talking about. Amen. Now, this is speaking to Jesus. Who's he speaking to here? Watch this carefully. Jesus spoke these words to the apostles only. When Jesus is saying this, John, uh, uh, Mike, in John 14, 15, and 16, the context, read the context. In John 13, they were assembled together in the upper room having the Passover meal. Jesus is with the 12 apostles only here, and if you follow the pronouns, he's promising them this baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit, which the world cannot receive, but they could because they were with him from the beginning, and one of the signs of it is they could remember everything Jesus had said. 
No way does Mike have that today. Number one, it was never promised to him. It wasn't promised to anyone but the apostles. Number two, he's not producing the fruits of that spirit. Number three, he's out of the time zone from when it was given. Number four, he's taken away the purpose of it, which to confirm the word, which we now already have. And therefore, there's the, the apostle Paul would say, I'm going to show you a more excellent way than having those gifts. I'm going to give you the word, the perfect law of liberty. But let's continue in my illustration here. In Acts chapter 8. Follow me here, folks. In Acts chapter 8, verse 14. When the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Why? The apostles heard that the Samaritans had become Christians, okay? The apostle and Simon had even obeyed the gospel. He, he was baptized, became a Christian. And the apostles, uh, which were at Jerusalem, heard Samaria had received the word. They sent Peter and John there. Why did Peter and John have to go to Samaria? Philip was already there. He already baptized them. Why did, why did Peter and John have to go? Now watch this carefully. For as yet, um, who when they were come down, that is Peter and John, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. They didn't receive the Holy Ghost yet. They were baptized. They were Christians, but they hadn't received this miraculous measure of the Spirit, Mike. That's what's taking place. So why did they have to go there? Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, of the special function during these days, was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands. That's how it was imparted to those in the first century, because they did not yet have the New Testament written, and if they were going to continue to operate as Christians, they needed to have that miraculous intervention during this time before the Word of God was completed. That's how they would know it. That's how they would have it. Now watch carefully, please. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Well, say, give me this power that on whomsoever I lay my hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said to him, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast uh, thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast ne uh, neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Him wanting something that God never promised him, telling people that's what they get, illustrates his heart's not right with God when he's taking it out of context and saying things that just aren't so. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Well, what happened? He saw that the Holy Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands. Well, let's continue. In Acts chapter 19, uh, we, we've been here several times already. This is the Ephesians. They were already baptized with John's baptism, which was water, by the way, even though he doesn't see it there. That's John's baptism. Paul said, John very baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. There it is, baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, I already established in several passages that being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ is water baptism. Where's the water in the text? Here it is again. Are you seeing it? Now, watch this. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Well, according to Mike, they get it automatically even before they're baptized. But here the text says, Paul had to lay his hands on them. That's how it was imparted during this time. Follow me here, we're not finished. Look at Titus chapter 1, verse 2. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Paul said, Titus had this, the putting on of his hands. And then Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 1. I long to see you, he's writing to Rome, that I might impart some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. He had to go there personally so that he could lay his hands upon them so that they could have the spiritual gift for that time period. Thank you.
Okay. I'm sorry, put the, I turned it off when I, there you go. Can you hear me? Say again. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Good. Can you hear him okay back there? Yep. Okay. I don't believe the Spirit is doing anything different than what the Word of God, Jesus, what Jesus primarily, and again, Steve brought up some good points there in regards to the Word. Uh, there's times where they, they spoke by their Word, it says. So then obviously it's talking about the words that were coming out of their mouth. Um, I, I don't know necessarily that it's talking about the Bible. I would encourage everybody to do research. Uh, Steve had mentioned that miracles were done until the development of the Bible. Well, I'd again encourage everybody to do some research in regards to when the Bible was actually put together. When we came up with 66 books that you hold in your hand that are a canon, a completed canon, uh, if miracles were done until the latter 4th century, that's a different argument. So uh, the second thing I wanted to bring up was, uh, and I'm not in the negative, so I'm just making this very quickly. Um, the second thing would be, third thing, I'm sorry. The third thing would be in Acts chapter 10, Steve made a, a discussion from there in regards to baptism in the name of the Lord. Uh, and then he went to Acts chapter 19, and he showed you that they didn't receive the Holy Spirit until after the water baptism, but in Acts chapter 10, they have received the Spirit, and then they're saying, what hinders them from being baptized? The Word doesn't contradict itself. Yeah. Number, the fourth point I want to bring up is in John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, yes, Jesus is lifting up this free chapter prayer for his disciples. It might even be longer than that, matter of fact. But let's just say that. If you quote me on that, I had the wrong amount of chapters. That's something totally different. But either way, um, the world. What is the world? Well, look at verse 30. John chapter 14, verse 30. It says, I will not speak much more for you, for the ruler of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me. That ruler of the world, it's not talking about the universal world. It's talking about the world, meaning the people that are against Christ, the world. In John chapter 15, verse 18, if the world hates you, not the whole universal planet, but it's those that are contrary to the things of God. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. Not everybody on the planet hated Jesus. There's a context to the word world. Also in John chapter 17, again, this is a three chapter prayer. Notice what Jesus says in John chapter 17, verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, are in me, and I in thee, and they also be in us, that the world may believe that thou did send me. Hopefully you notice there that this is talking about you know, again, it's not Jesus is not just praying for his apostles. He's praying for those that are going to receive the word through the apostles. So I would, I would disagree with that point there. And I'll, I'll leave that alone and I'll probably develop that at some later time. I want to go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 38. Notice again, they were cut in their heart and then told to repent and be baptized. One of the questions I ask myself when I read that text is, why were some of the people not cut to the heart? So here they are preaching to the Jews, and they're preaching to them, they're telling them the word of God, and some of them were cut to the heart. Others weren't. Why not? Because they were better than the other people, smarter than the other people. No. Notice it began with inner conviction. I often explain baptism to our congregation at the Viewpoint Bible Church as immersed discipleship. Christ, by providing everything pertaining to life and godliness, again, Christ, by providing everything pertaining to life and godliness, Christ providing everything pertaining to life and godliness, Christ providing, enables us to love from a pure heart. Again, the goal of our faith, to love from a pure heart, have a good conscience, and a sincere faith. As the text of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14 tells us, the blood of the Lord cleanses the consciences from dead works to serve the living God. Our immersion, or our baptism, is an ongoing reality as we grow in Christ and his fulfilled work. Dare I call it 
drinking of the water of life. What we read at the end of the book of Revelation. Not a physical demonstration of being fully immersed in water, but rather continuing in Christ, continually being washed by the water of the word. That's what gives us a good conscience. We continue to read the phrase of being baptized in the name of, which Steve had brought up in regards to Acts chapter uh, 10. To be baptized in the name of something is a sign of identifying with that name and taking on that name's character, as well as a commitment from that moment forward when you take on that baptism in the name of to live one's life as a representative of that name. We are to do all things in the name of Jesus Christ, according to Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. That's the point I have continued to make. We are to do all things in the name of Jesus Christ. To be baptized into Christ is to be consumed, overwhelmed, if you don't like the term consumed, overwhelmed with Christ. With a life for his glory, doing all things in his name for his glory. Repentance through, through John's water baptism was a good first step. But the Spirit's work is what truly saves and secures. That's what's going on in Acts chapter 19. They were baptized by John. They had a repentance through the water baptism by John. But that was not good enough. They needed to receive the Holy Spirit. Interestingly enough, a bit of research into the Greek reveals that the word baptism there is in the passive voice. And it's also plural in Acts chapter 10. The whole house was baptized at the same time. They had no participation in the baptism. It was done to them without their submission. And being plural, it means it happened to them all at the same time. The only example of active voice baptism, again, I'm not a Greek scholar. I don't pretend to be, I don't desire to be. However, the only time that you see this active voice baptism is when the individual actively submits and participates is in John's Old Covenant water baptism and in the eunuch's baptism in Acts chapter 9, which again, I explained last night. Why the eunuch needed to be water baptized. Well, he didn't need to be water baptized, but why he was water baptized in that time. In Colossians 2, 9 through 13, we read, For in him all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. He is the head over every ruler and authority, and in him you are also circumcised with a circumcision performed without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your wrongdoings and uncircumcision of your flesh. When did he circumcise you? When you were dead in the wrongdoings and the uncircumcision of your flesh. He made you alive. He made you alive with him, having forgiven us of all our wrongdoings. That's Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 to 13. Not Mike Miano, not Steve Basden. Nobody here. That's the text of Colossians. The interesting thing I thought about this was, okay, so circumcision made with hands corresponds to baptism made with hands. Circumcision without hands would correspond to what then? A baptism done without hands. So I did a little bit of research into this phrase, without hands in the scriptures. It comes up very minimally, so it's a good study. Go to blueletterbible.com, just put in without hands and see what pops up. There's only very few references to that in scripture, and you know what it refers to? The workings of God. There's one other thing in scripture that was done without hands. It was the holy temple. The, the temple that was made without hands. You know, there was one physical temple, and there was a temple that's in the heavens that was made without hands. It's completely the work of God. It's mysterious. Well, that's the baptism that we're, cir we're circumcised by. That's bat being baptized into Christ, the circumcision made without hands. All of this said regarding the true gospel and the baptism that saves, I have to continue to admonish and exhort regarding the power and benefit of the narrative theology. A consistent outlining of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Take a step back, take yourself out of the text. Because if you notice what we're doing here is we're doing a lot of, well, that was for the Jews and the apostles. This is for us. And then I'm arguing that's for the Jews and the apostles. And this is for us. We're doing a lot of back and forth here. Take yourself out of the story for a moment. What is the point of this whole narrative that we read? Consider the point of the whole narrative. What was the point being made through the entire Old Testament? His people were disobedient. He gave them a law. What did they do with it? They squandered it. They didn't obey. They were unwilling. They were disobedient. They, they were unwilling. That's what the Old Testament is revealing to you. He gave them a blessing. The law was a grace. He gave it to them. They did not obey. The nations did not have that grace. What did the nations do? 
develop idolatry, innate idolatry. Just continue to develop more and more idols. Man left on his own will be disobedient, will be unwilling, and will develop idolatry. In Romans chapter 1, we read, I'm going to go ahead and read the text and I'll explain. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now this text has been used and abused by Christians for quite some time. It's important for us to know that who are the people that suppress the truth in unrighteousness? It was the Jews. They were given the truth. They suppressed it in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. They were given a law. For God made it evident to them. God made them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what was made, so that they, or without excuse, again, you have to keep it in context here who it's talking to. For that even though they knew God, there was only one person that God, only one nation that God revealed himself to. He's the God of Jacob, the God of Israel. So it's talking about Israel. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks but became futile in their own speculations and in the foolish heart, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for the image of the form of a corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over to the lusts of their heart, to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged their natural function for that which was unnatural. And in the same way also, men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts, receiving of their own persons, receiving, I'm sorry, receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not fit to, see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, Full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boasters, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they knew the ordinance of God, that they were to practice, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but give hearty approval to those who practice them. That's wicked. Wicked. These people were given the law of God. They were given righteousness. If they would obey it, if you do this, you will live. If you don't do this, you will die. And what did they do? They became increasingly wicked. Man is wicked to the core. Even when given God's help, the law of Moses, they're still depraved and move away. So that's the goal. And then you move further in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8, verses 8 through 9. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. In Psalm chapter 53, we read about how no man seeks God. Men are darkened. They, no man wants to seek after God. No man desires good. This is reiterated by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3, talking not only about the Jews, but also of the Gentiles. All men are wicked. The Jews, given a law, will not come to God. They're given grace, they don't come. That's why in 2 Corinthians, it's Moses, <coughs> who's revealed through Moses, had a grace, had a glory, but a greater glory, glory through the new covenant. So, again, my point being here is that man is desperately wicked. Israel was desperately wicked. The Gentiles created idolatry again and again. You see this rebuked by the prophets. So the Old Testament is highlighting man is wicked. What hope is there then? For man. What was the mystery of the ages that was being made known through the prophets? Is it that man will believe in God? Well, it looks like there in that text in Romans chapter 1, those people acknowledged God, but they dishonored him. So belief isn't good enough. And all of us know that text, right? Even the demons believe in shudder. So belief isn't good enough. Repentance. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, it talks about a repentance unto life and a repentance unto death. Repentance is not enough. Water baptism. Was Judas water baptized? I'll just leave that there. The biblical narrative reveals that if God did not unconditionally elect some, meaning put a spirit within them that will make them willing and obedient, there would be no hope at all. 
All throughout the Old Testament, you read about a remnant. Joel chapter 2, verse 32. This is the earliest prophecy we have. God promised a remnant. He will have a remnant that will turn to him. Micah chapter 5, verse 7. A remnant. Isaiah 10 through 11. A remnant. Isaiah 28, a remnant. Isaiah 43, a remnant. I can speak fast because this is on recording, so I hope that you might consider going back and listening to the recording, maybe writing the verses down. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 22, a remnant. Ezekiel 14, I'm sorry, Matthew 24, verse 22, what does Jesus talk about? The elect that would be saved. Because that was the story of the Old Testament. There would come a time where there would be, a, there would be an elect that would be saved. I find it interesting because it sounds as though Steve's saying that the apostles were saved in a different way than the rest of the people. I assert no way. That's, just, that's God being partial, showing partiality to some. They had the same problem the rest of us do. They were sinners in need of grace. If God doesn't elect, or to use another biblical phrase, if God doesn't appoint, if God does not raise up some today for his glory by putting a spirit in them that gives them life, that makes them willing and obedient, there's no hope at all. Let's talk about the Lord making man willing. In Psalm chapter 51, verse 12, it says here, Restore me to the joy of salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. That's David crying out to the Lord. Lord, give me a willing spirit, because I know in and of myself I'm not willing. Psalm 64, 65, verse 4. How blessed is the one, I love this text, how blessed is the one whom you choose, and you bring near to you to dwell in your courts. We will be satisfied with the goodness of your house and your holy temple. It's a beautiful allusion to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. How did Adam find the Garden of Eden? He didn't. He was placed there. Again, I'll read the text. How blessed is the one whom you choose to dwell and bring near to you to dwell in your courts. Amen. Psalm 110, verse 3. Thy people will volunteer freely in the day of power, in holy array from the womb of dawn. Thy youth are thee as give. Again, uh, interesting re uh, reason I bring that up is if you do a study on the word give, it's an allusion to his remnant. Those texts I just listed to you very fast, if you go through them, I believe it's Micah chapter 7 or Micah 5, talks about the dew of Hermon. It's the remnant. It's a remnant promise. He had a remnant that he would call out. That's the way God saves. He has a remnant people that he unconditionally elects. In Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3. For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and the streams on the ground. Parallel, Hebrew parallelism repeats the point twice. I will pour out my spirit. So what's the water he's pouring out? I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings upon your descendants. If I may just go back to the book of Psalms, something I have to make mention of. I usually don't use psalms to develop doctrine. Psalms are wisdom literature that can be used and abused, have been used and abused. The only reason I felt comfortable going to psalms is because Steve used psalms to assert that we must obey the commandments, uh, which David's commandments were, I'll get to that here in a moment, it was either maybe the 10, 613, however you might put that together. We'll deal with that here in a second. So, uh, again, so the, I wouldn't use the book of Psalms normally to uh, really push uh, my, my doctrine, but I believe Psalm 65, verse 4, reads rather clearly, when the Lord chooses and causes near to bring to his temple, to his presence. It's simple stuff. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 21, And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit, which is upon you, and my words, which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring. Notice how the people get the word of the Lord put in. The Lord puts it there. In Ezekiel chapter 11, again, my point here was the Lord's making me willing. The Lord's the one putting these words in me. The Lord's the one doing the work. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19. And I shall give them a new heart. Remember, the Lord looks at the heart. I shall give them a new heart. I shall put a new spirit within them. You have a spirit. There's spirits of men. And then there's a holy spirit, meaning a spirit that is set apart. The Greek word is agios, set apart, a different spirit. We all have a spirit, that spirit that is increasingly wicked and desperate. And then we have a 
willing spirit that the Lord has given to us, if we be willing. And I shall take the heart of stone out of them, the heart of flesh, and give them a heart of flesh. I'm sorry. Shall take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances. The Lord gives that spirit. And then he repeats the same thing in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 through 27. Matter of fact, I'm going to start at verse 25, and I'm going to read a couple of different verses here. Verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your filthiness and from your idols. Notice who's doing the water baptism there, the Lord. Verse 29, moreover, I will save you from all of your uncleanliness. I will call for the grain and multiply it. I will not bring famine upon you. I will multiply the fruit. The Lord is the one doing this work, the fruit, bearing fruit. Verse 33, on the day I will cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited. That's a kingdom promise. He, the, the government of the, that will be on his shoulders will know no end. The increase will continue. And lastly, I'll just mention those verses that I had brought up before, 26 through 27. Moreover, I will put a new heart and a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my ways and that you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Thank you. Can you go again? So we didn't take a break the last time, which we normally do. <laughs> so, and then you can conclude that. This is your, your third and final. Yeah, this is third and final. Then you all take questions if you're up to it. Yeah. Everybody, uh, hold her, except for the restroom for a moment. Let's just get hold her a moment or two. And uh, as soon as he gets back, that's okay to Michael. I'll get into it.
Okay, let's uh, be finding our seats and we'll, we'll get into my last speech of the evening I have the opportunity to give here. So, uh, Mario, you say one, buddy. Okay, we're playing Wheel of Fortune again. We're playing the Wheel of Fortune again. Mike asserted there that God unconditionally elects some remnant, the elected. And we're going to touch on that in just a moment, but I want you to notice that, again, he goes back to this God working on people separately and apart from the Word. It's not true. It's not true. Um, I, there's an old, there's an old uh, saying, those of you who are my age or older probably remember a commercial. The Marine Corps used to put out this commercial saying, we're looking for a few good men. That reminds me of God. God don't take just anyone. He only wants the good, the ones that are honest. How do you exhibit whether you're going to be honest or not? Through what you're going to do, through your life, through your actions, which should be guided by the word. I want to bring a couple of things to your attention. The arguments made about the imparting of the laying on of the apostles' hands, how the Holy Spirit worked when Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was given by the laying on of the apostles' hands. He didn't address that. He didn't touch that. He, but there's one thing that's for sure, for certain. They got it differently than how Mike says he gets it. Another thing for sure and certain. He's getting it at a different time than what it was promised to and for at that time. And he's getting it for a different purpose. He said in his last speech, and I wrote this down, that you know, I have the apostles saved differently than others. Here's Michael's problem. He's equating baptism of the Holy Spirit that the apostles have as salvation. They were baptized also with water, Mike, under John's baptism. But they were baptized with the Holy Spirit in order that they could confirm their word that others had to be baptized with water in order to be saved. That's the idea in there. That's what's going on. So because they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, he thinks that's how they were saved. But the Bible never says that, ever. In fact, one of the greatest apostles, one of the greatest apostles who believed for three days and nights, who repented for three days and who prayed for three days and three nights, Fasted for three days and three nights. Confessed Jesus on the road to Damascus. Wasn't saved until he was baptized. Why tarryest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. Now, Mike said that only in the Old Testament was the persons involved with this. And in the New Testament, and I'm paraphrasing, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It is God doing it to you not us participating in it. But in Acts chapter 22, verse 16, the middle voice is used there, meaning the subject participates in the act of the baptizing. Paul literally had to participate in this baptism. Now, I'm no Greek scholar either, but when you can see that there's a middle voice being used there, if you look at some of the Greek fundamental elements of that, that means that he participated in that activity along with the Lord doing something. That's the idea. And that's proof right there in and of and by itself that he had to actually, and, and that's Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Let me get over there. Um, before, I, before I get there, though, I, I want, I've been wanting to get to this. I'm just going to do it real quick. I put it works up here because he keeps saying there's a distinction between uh, what God does to you and, and there's nothing you can do for yourself and et cetera, et cetera. But, I got two categories here of works. And I said this in Long Island. I think I mentioned it yesterday. The Bible mentions all kinds of different works. Many. This, this list is not exhaustive. This is a very small list of works that the Bible talks about. There's the works of the devil, 1 John 3 8. The works of merit, the works of evil, the works of earning a living, the works of the law of Moses, Romans 3.19. Those works will not save, could not save, cannot save anyone. But then there's these works. Works that will save. The works of God. Works God will save. I know who agree with me on that. The works of faith. 
the works of faith. The work you've got to work at it. You've got to do something. The works of righteousness, the works of love, the works of Christ. We have to participate, like Paul had to participate in his baptism. Water baptism is the thing that removes sin, not Holy Spirit baptism. If it was Holy Spirit baptism, he could get up to you today and speak in tongues he'd never studied before. He could prophesy. He would remember all things whatsoever Christ said. He could be an interpreter. He could do all of the nine miraculous gifts that are mentioned in the Bible, plus some. Jesus said that they would do greater things than he. He could not only walk on water, he could probably fly to the moon. I don't know, but he could do certainly these miraculous things. If he had the gift of the Holy Spirit that produced miracles the way that they did, he could heal people that have cancer. He could do all these different things, but he can't. So let's continue. He, he, wanted, he wanted to talk about Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. And he said that Cornelius, let me, let me go to my uh, e-sword here real quick. I want to bring th th these passages up. That Cornelius had the Holy Spirit before he was baptized. I cannot disagree with that. He most certainly did. Cornelius was a Gentile. Gentiles, according to the Jews, were like heathen. They were like dogs. In fact, they, it was forbidden in their culture to even eat with the Gentile because the Gentiles were so unclean. So, what had to happen was, God had to send Peter to this man Cornelius, who was a Gentile, and had to work certain things in order for the Jews to accept that the Gentiles we're on equal footing now with the Jews. They could not be saved any way differently than the Jews could. Okay? So we go to Acts chapter 10, and we see that Cornelius uh, spake there uh, in tongues, and, and Peter's response to that. Let me, let me pull this up here on my computer if I can, because it's easier for me to show, slow down. <laughs> I, whenever I have the text in front of me and I'm pointing it out. So should be on the board right now. Peter's on the housetop. Cornelius sends men to go get him. Peter has his vision. And Peter uh, uh, called them and lodged them. And tomorrow Peter received moral uh, coming in. Cornelius met them, fell down and worshipped him. Peter took him saying, stand up, I myself am a man. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, you know that it is unlawful, verse 28, a thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call a man, any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gates, and as soon as I was sent for, I asked therefore for what intent ye have sent for me. Cornelius said, four days ago he explains, he was praying, and God sent him in this vision. And, and told him to send for Peter. In verse 31, this, this, this angel, the, the Lord, this Lord is speaking to Cornelius, and he says, Thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in the remembrance of the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak to thee. Peter had words. For Cornelius. In fact, Cornelius was earlier told in the same text that Peter would tell him what he needed to do in order to be saved. Peter's affirming this here. I have words to tell you. That's how he's going to be saved. Immediately, therefore, I sent and, and for you, and it's good that you've come. Now, therefore, we're all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. We need to hear the commands of God. Okay, so what happens? Then Peter opened his mouth. Said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth them and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. He that feareth them and does what? Worketh righteousness is accepted. Some of the words Peter's speaking, he's got to hear this. What's, what's he need? The words. What do you got to do? You got to work righteousness in the fear of God. The word which God sent him to the servant of Greece, I'll preach in peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say, you know, which is published throughout Judea, 
began from Galilee after the baptism of John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Then he goes on to tell him about these things. We're all witnesses. This Lord Jesus God had raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people, testify. These words are what we're going to say, people. And as we continue this text, I want you to notice something that happens here. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. And as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Huh. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. This is the works of righteousness that they had to do by the words of Peter in order to be saved. Did the Holy Ghost fall on them? Yes. But now, what's the purpose of that? What's the purpose of that? It's to confirm something. What is it confirming? That the Jews could not call the Gentiles unclean any longer. God's bringing them in. Let me show you that in Acts chapter 18 or 15 by Peter's own words. You see, Paul and Barnabas are out preaching to the Gentiles. And they are teaching the Gentiles that they have to be baptized in order to be saved. I know that because that's what Paul talked to the Ephesians about. That's what Paul told the Galatians, for we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's how they get into Christ. He told the Ephesians that, he told the Galatians that, told the Colossians that. But now there's some Jews that are saying, that's not true, Paul. You can't be teaching the Gentiles just that. These Gentiles need to be circumcised. We're going to get on this circumcision thing in a few minutes. They have to keep the law of Moses. These Gentiles must keep the law of Moses. And so there's this big argument. And Paul's saying, no, they don't have to keep their, uh, the, the law of Moses. And, and, and some of the Judaizers, some of those Jewish Christians are saying, yes, they do have to keep the law of Moses. That's the argument. So they send Paul back to Jerusalem. This is called the Jerusalem Council here in Acts chapter 15 to inquire of Peter and James and the rest of the apostles what God's will is for the Gentiles. Now watch this carefully, beginning verse 6. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. Do they have to keep the law of Moses? And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth shall, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Peter said, You know, I'm the one who first went to the Gentiles, and that by my mouth the Gentiles would believe. That's who, he's appealing all the way back to Cornelius here, the first Gentile that came in. He's talking about what happened with Cornelius. Well, what about it, Peter? And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. God knows your hearts, you Jews. You would not accept the Gentiles. Your hearts are hardened to the Gentiles. So what did he do? He gave them the Holy Spirit to confirm that they were eligible to be saved the same way the Jews were, not by the law of Moses, but through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of him receiving the Holy Ghost, not for salvation. Peter explicitly says that he gave them the Holy Ghost to bear witness. That's what the Holy Ghost did. Bear witness, not saved. It bear witness that the words they were teaching were from God. That's how they could speak in the, Holy, uh, in the tongues in order to confirm the word. So God did this especially for Cornelius because the Jewish hearts were so hard against the Gentiles, they would have never accepted the Gentiles unless the Gentiles first became a part of Judaism and followed the law of Moses. But Peter said, no, he puts no difference between us and them purifying their hearts by faith. 
Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. What was the word that Peter told them? Can any man forbid water that these should be baptized like as of we? No. And he commanded them to be baptized. I just read that in Acts chapter 10, two seconds ago. He saved them the same way he saved those in Acts chapter 2. Let's go to Acts chapter 2 because he's brought it up several times. And he's talking about how they received and they were cut to the heart in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. So let's take a look at that, please. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter and the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Mike says nothing. Nothing. Mike says, Jesus does it to you. There's nothing you do. You don't participate in anything. God does it to you. You're predestined for ordained. You're the elect. You, you, it's unconditional. These people thought different. What do we have to do? Well, Peter didn't say, well, don't do anything. Christ already did it. Peter said, to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. How? By the laying on of the apostles' hands. When? During that certain time period when they were producing the Word of God. What was the, what was the gift of the Holy Ghost for? To confirm the Word. The as it was being given to them. Now watch this. Promises unto you and your children for those that are far off, and as many as the Lord our God to call. And when many other words did testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward or crooked generation. Save yourselves, save yourselves, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And then they that re gladly receive. Where, 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 uh, save yourselves from this uh, unfortunate or crooked generation. When the Lord's going to saying, save yourselves. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. What shall we do? Repent and be baptized. Save yourselves. Now, when the Bible says save yourselves, this is not saying that it was in and of and by their own merit, or in or by their own power. It was something that they had to participate in that God provided them through his grace. God's offering them his grace, but grace is found in Christ Jesus. I asked him this in Long Island. Are all spiritual blessings found in Christ Jesus? He said, yes. Grace is a spiritual blessing. Where's the grace of God found? In Christ Jesus. How do we get into Christ Jesus? For as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And it's not Holy Spirit baptism. It's something we participate in. What shall we do? Repent and be baptized. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And he commanded them to be baptized. See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? It's something they had to do. They stopped the chariot. They got out in the middle of the desert where they found water. They both went down in the water. Philip baptized the eunuch. It's all throughout. He says yeah. there's nothing we do to comply the Bible continually says God's looking for honest people who will accept the Spirit through the Word. The sword of the Spirit is the Word. The sword of the Spirit is the Word. Now, I want to get to a couple of other things. In Roman, he cited Romans chapter 8. Now, let me get over here. Uh, uh, Romans chapter 8, if I can find my marker there. In verse 9, he went here and he cited this. Now, watch this carefully. That that is, they which are children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise are accounted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I come, Sarah shall have a son. And he goes on to say, so you're not of the flesh. You're not of the flesh. Oh, I'm in the wrong one. My, eight, my, eight, bad, my bad. Romans 8, 9. I went to Romans 9, 8. All right, my, my bad. Romans 8, 9. Uh, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Okay. So he says, it's not about law. It's not about law. It's not about the fleshly carnal things of the law. But it's about the Spirit. Wait a minute, Mike. You missed something, my friend. Let's back up. Can we back up just a little bit here? In, in, in Romans 8. Look at Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What do we have to do? Walk after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free 
from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death was the law of Moses, which still existed at that time. And it's the law of the Spirit, the law of the Spirit, the law of the Spirit, which made them free from the law of Moses. He thinks it's just the Spirit working somehow. Paul continually says it's the words of the Spirit. It's the gospel of the Spirit. It's the law of the Spirit. He says there's no law. Paul says there is law. And then he goes to Romans 3 and says it's all by grace. Now watch Romans 3 real quick. And I want to take you to verse number 27. Romans 3, 27. I'm going to go just to 30 seconds over here. Where is the boasting then? Paul's talking to Jews who thought they were special because they had the law of Moses. He's comparing them to the Gentiles who are also being saved. And they think they're special because they have the law of Moses. And Paul lets them know in no uncertain terms, where's the boasting then? You can't boast because you have the law of Moses. You're sinners too. Where is the, it is excluded by what law? Mike says there is no law. By works? No, not works of the old covenant law. That's what he's comparing here contextually. Nay, but by the law of faith. The law of what? There's no law, Mike. Mike? Mike, I'm done. Yeah, uh, we're going to have, Mike's going to take some questions until he's satisfied. And please, limit your questions to two and leave the debating for he and I. That's right, two questions. So Mike will take and answer whoever, whosoever he will. Uh, may, I, may, I, may I begin by asking two questions to you, Mike? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yes, he says he's capable. Right. Steve, would you like the Bible? Would you like your stuff here? Oh, I'm sorry. Let me get that out of your way. My bad. Don't worry. Nice one. So my question, Mike, is this. Do you believe that when God promises to do a work in an individual, that that work always then will be accomplished? Yes. All right. Isaiah could you, 55 11 is the reason I believe that. Right. Could you then explain? Could well, you let then me just let me explain why I believe that. Okay. Isaiah 55 11 says that the, the word performs what it set out to do. And then also in Isaiah, Jeremiah 1 27, we read that the Lord watches over his word to perform it. So, yes, amen. Okay. All right. Then perhaps you can answer <clears throat> the promise of God in Deuteronomy 7 and about verses 7 and 8. He says, Maybe a little bit late. Maybe 24. I'm sorry. I will drive out the nations before you. Mm -hmm. There's promise in Deuteronomy 7. In Numbers 33 and verse 52. Well, wait a minute. What's your question about well, Deuteronomy? I, just, I, I, I asked you the question, and I want these three passages. Three questions. Put, no, 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 no. It's just three passages put together. Okay. Okay. So the first passage is in Deuteronomy 7, I will drive out the nations before you. The second passage is in Numbers 33 and verse 52, when it says, God says to them, you drive them out. All right? But in Judges chapter 1, there's at least six of the tribes that did not drive them out. Here's the question. God promised, I will drive them out. Then he says, you drive them out. But they didn't drive them out, and he was working with Old Covenant Israel could you explain that? Sure. Well, I don't believe Scripture contradicts itself. I hope you don't either. No. Um, so the Lord says that he will drive them out. The Lord gives the power to Israel. That, that was something actually I, I didn't quite understand about Steve's message was the Lord was the one that was working through Israel as they were driving out nations, as they were in the land. The Lord's work with Israel didn't cease to exist after they got into the land of Canaan. The Lord still worked miracles and wonders in the land of Canaan. That's why they were able to overcome the people around them. So what it seems like you're trying to say is that, so the Lord promised something and the Lord did not accomplish it. That, that would be problematic to me. So I'm not sure why you're putting those three verses together in that because manner. God makes a promise, you expect an individual to participate with it. And if you don't participate with it, yeah. you haven't complied and God doesn't do the work. And that's exactly what happened here in Judges 1. Well, thank you for your commentary. However, uh, <laughs> I will tell you that the scriptures pointed out that in matters of salvation, that's not a matter of salvation. In matters of salvation, the promise was that he would cause, he would make willing, he would cause people, 
that he chose to come near to his dwelling. Scripture doesn't contradict itself. Okay, somebody else, please. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Um, okay. Are the Mormons, do you believe in abortion? Do, like, do, you does support, it do you support abortion? No. I'll never have an abortion. Well, when a baby dies, when a woman aborts that child, where is it from? I have no idea. I was I was here three years ago. Let me clarify for you. I was here three years ago, and I was asked that question in this assembly. And I was very clear on the fact that I have no idea, and I don't pretend to know, and I believe any man that goes about doing his, doing his magic with the word of God to try to assume what's happening to an aborted a child is blasphemy. Well, I don't remember you being here right before I was here. But, um, I mean, the Bible does say, God does say that they be holy. And if anything, holy, it goes to heaven, it's not to death. Where does it say that? I would need to verse and I would need to study out that context of it. Everything I've read in the scripture shows that man left to his own devices is increasingly wicked. Luke 1.33. Let's see what Luke 1.33 says. We're saying that that says that the baby is holy. In Luke 1.33, we're reading about a child named Jesus. And there it says, he will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. No, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him. I'm reading the wrong text. You said Luke. It said Luke 1.33. Oh, you did? Okay, yes. Sorry, I thought I was reading the wrong text. Uh, the Son of the Most High, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. That's Luke 1.33. So, no, that's... Where did it say anything about it? No. So, I'm sorry. No, sir. I think it's the next chapter. Um, well, when we find the verse, we could uh, do some contextual study and find out if that's exactly Every what the text male that opens the womb shall be called holy. That Where is that? Text. Every male that opens the womb shall be called Where holy. Where is that? That's what I, I mean. Again, I, I'm a, I understand that there's a lot of verses. As Holger just rightly showed us, there's a verse we could pull out and say, God promised something, and then all of a sudden it seems like the promise wasn't fulfilled. So we have to be careful when we're proving text. And scripture does not go against itself. It is harmonized. So um, now let me clarify something for you, sir, and just to be very flat out. I don't believe in abortion. I encourage people against abortion. I, when it comes to aborted children, I pray for, I pray against abortion in our society, and I pray that we would do everything we can to disciple people to the best of our ability. To make, to, again, so the Lord can declare them holy, not that they would be holy on their own. I don't know if you consider born or bad. Yeah, again, the Lord's the pot. You know, I didn't get to that text tonight in Romans 9, but you know, it seems pretty clear. Any other questions? Mario? Yeah. Um, John 4. I'm, I'm, I'm confused on um, what do you believe that the text is saying? Because from I heard you was heard that Jesus didn't baptize anyone, but the text says, that he baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not. So my, my question is, what's your understanding of those two verses? I'm going to read the verses for us. When therefore the Lord knew the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. So I believe that Jesus' disciples were baptizing, and they were baptizing in water, as we talked about last night. The reason why I believe water baptism was being done during that time was for a transitionary detail, which, again, it seems like we were in seeming agreement about the transition. So uh, there was particular things. Steve didn't say particular. He said certain things in regards to Cornelius's uh, conversion. So I believe certain things were happening in the first century, to quote Steve, uh, in, during that time of transition that are not necessarily happening today. Now... I do believe they were water baptizing for that very reason. I also believe that the Spirit was doing its work, baptizing people, meaning causing them to be overwhelmed with the things of God. That's why people were actually turning to Jesus, right? That's, as I've shown you, Ezekiel 11, Ezekiel 36, he says that he will make man willing. He will cause, Psalm 65, 4, he will cause people to come to him. So I do believe that Jesus was doing that work of baptizing that only Jesus can do, as we've marked out through this debate. 
that only Jesus could do that work. So yes, the disciples were baptizing in water for the effects of that generation. And Jesus was baptizing in the spirit, which is the only baptism that he can do. And although Jesus was not baptizing in water, but his disciples were. It goes back to the same thing we said last night about John's baptism. What's going on in Acts chapter 19? They had John's baptism. They were baptized by water. And then Jesus' baptism, baptism by the spirit. I don't see a contradiction. I don't see the, hopefully that I explained it to you. No, the I'm disciples saying, were baptizing in water. I'm a bit okay, oh, no, so I'm yeah. second question is, was that authority given by Jesus? Yes, uh, again, I think the, the point would be that there was an existing history of baptism in the Jewish faith. So they understood that when men needed to go to the temple to gather at Solomon's portico, when men needed to undergo moments of purifying themselves, they would be water baptized. So it made sense that God would speak to those people in ways that they would understand by having them undergo water baptism. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I believe we have a part three tomorrow. We, we have what? Part three and four. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, tomorrow, we're going to have worship at uh, 10, uh, 1030 to 1130 is Bible study. 1130 to 1230 is church worship. We're going to have a potluck meal. We've got chicken ordered and submarine sandwiches and all kinds of goodies. Uh, we hope you can make it for lunch with us. Following the potluck, Mike will, will continue our last round of exchanges and a debate. 2 p.m. 2 p.m. Uh, approximately right about 2 p.m. Yeah. Did you want to mention the radio program? The radio program, Mike's going to be on with me tomorrow morning on the radio program from 9 to 10. And uh, yeah, this, I think mostly everybody here already knows that. Already knows that. that cool. so. Hey, Mike, thank you. Thank, thank you. 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 Th